thank you, Dean Brooke, for speaking so calmly and slowly so that we could all pick up <laughs> what you had to offer. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Ian Holloway, the Dean of Law at the University of Calgary, who will be talking about a Canadian law school curriculum for this age. Thank, thank you very much, John. And uh, um, let me begin, uh, Phil, by offering my thanks and our thanks on behalf of all of us at the University of Calgary. I had the good fortune to participate in the beginning of the law school centenary at the, the gala dinner last September, and it's a delight to be here at the end of it as well. And all of us at Calgary uh, congratulate you on the, on the centennial. We're very proud to be in the same province as a law school of this stature and history, so thank you so much. And it's a delight to be on this panel. You know, Kim is the dean of my law school, my alma mater. And Margaret uh, is on the faculty at the law school where I began my academic career. Uh, John, I, I have the good fortune to be heavily involved in the law school admission council, and it was John who got me involved in that. And, uh, and John Hunter is someone with whom I work very closely as part of the, um, the federation accreditation process. And like many of you, I'm not particularly happy with the outcome of it, but I, but I want you all to know, I want you all to know that had it not been for John's honor and grace and leadership, the outcome would have been much, much less happy for us in legal education. So it's a delight to be here. So as John Law said, I want to talk to you about uh, what I conceive of as a law school, Canadian law school curriculum for this age. But I want to start by saying that I think that we suffer from a clash of premises. It's a clash largely of our own creation, and it's one that we have striven mightily to avoid acknowledging. On one hand, um, we lay claim to be part of the academy, the Grand Collegium Academica as they described it at Bologna a thousand years ago. And that was the essence of the struggle for control over legal education in Canada that played out in Ontario in the 1940s and 1950s. We aspire to a place, a rightful place, we heard that this morning, in the university in the vision of John Henry Newman. Uh, and the notion that we are the training ground for a craft guild, even a learned craft guild like the bar, is anathema to that view. On the other hand, um, we want to hold ourselves apart from certain aspects of regular university life that we don't find so agreeable, whether it relates to salaries, whether it relates to teaching loads or control over classroom space or any of the other myriad of things of day-to-day of, of -day, uh, irritants to academic life. We point to our connection with the legal profession as a justification for being treated differently. And the good news is that, for the most part, th th we, this game played in our favor for a long time. From, from the end of the Second World War uh, to the beginning of this century, um, it was what I call the Gilded Age for Canadian legal education. Now, history is never a straight line. It's always like a meandering river. Um, but the fact is that from the return of the men and women uh, from overseas, in, in beginning in the fall of 1945, right up to the end of the century, there was uh, an excess of demand oversupply of seats in law school, so it meant that the students we taught were, on the whole, very, very smart and, and motivated. The demand, the public demand for legal services continued to grow, which meant that lawyers became wealthier and wealthier. Um, tax flush governments in this country meant that university income, on the whole, uh, continued to, to grow. Um, um, uh, which meant that salaries in law faculties continued to grow, so that by the, end of, by the late 1990s, it was not uncommon for a, a, a brand new assistant professor of law to be earning more than a full professor of English or sociology. Um, it facilitated, the Gilded Age facilitated the uh, explosion in the growth of Canadian law schools uh, from the small handful that existed in 1945 to the 16 that existed by the, by the 1970s. Um, it, it allowed for uh, a uh, an exponential growth in the number of law professors teaching in this country, which in turn allowed for a reduction in teaching loads, which in turn allowed for, allowed for more time in research, which in turn facilitated the explosion of Canadian, of, of truly Canadian, Canadian scholarship. Now, it would be easy, but wrong, to characterize our Gilded Age. For a person, uh, for a young person looking backwards today to characterize our Gilded Age as a time of, of selfishness. Um, America's Gilded Age, in the, at the end of the 19th century, to be sure, was a time of great social inequality, uh, but it was also a time of great social mobility, and it was a time of tremendous advance in the sciences and the arts and, and in industry. In the same way, 
our Gilded Age in Canadian legal education was a time of tremendous creativity and innovation and of opportunity uh, for young Canadians uh, of hitherto marginalized backgrounds uh, to have access to our profession. So there is a lot about our Gilded Age to memorialize and to celebrate. The problem though, the problem though, is that throughout the Gilded Age, law schools came increasingly to be divorced from the lives of everyday working lawyers. The breach was never complete, but less and less did law schools use as their guide for innovation the needs of the profession uh, that students um, were about to join. And there's a paradox in this, and there's a paradox in this that we have to acknowledge, and that is that, that uh, a, a, a series of social and economic tr uh, changes had taken place that facilitated the growth of our industry, our legal education industry, um, uh, on the basis that Canada needed more and more lawyers. But the connection of those law schools to the profession for which our students were training became more and more attenuated. There's, that's a paradox that we owe it to ourselves to acknowledge. Well, this happy state of affairs, um, um, the ability to, to dodge the clash of premises, began to unravel in the late 1990s. Uh, specifically in 1995, when Mike Harris was elected Premier of Ontario, his administration was and remains extremely controversial, um, and it's not for today's uh, talk. But one of the things that he did, uh, as we know, was to deregulate tuition in professional programs, including law and business. At the same time, a young and ambitious scholar named Ron Daniels was appointed Dean of Law at the University of Toronto. Uh, and the move to deregulate tuition allowed Dean Daniels at the U of T to do what he wanted to do, and that was to separate the University of Toronto from the rest of the pack. And under his stewardship, the University of Toronto mounted an, an aggressive campaign to increase tuition to what, by Canadian standards anyway, anyway were astronomical levels. And he used the increased tuition to, uh, to, to recruit and to retain faculty and to attract top students from across the country. And, as we know, those of us who lived through it, Daniel's efforts were controversial, including uh, among certain segments of his own faculty, but measures, measured against his own objectives, they were wildly successful. But the impact went far beyond the University of Toronto. What the Harris reforms um, facilitated, permitted, was the operation of the market in legal education. What the Daniels reforms did was to kickstart that market. And so after the millennium, um, the dynamic among law schools changed considerably. We were uh, competing on at least three fronts. We were competing for the best students, we were competing for the best faculty, and we were competing as agents for our students um, for what were perceived to be uh, the best entry-level jobs. And this gradually, um, but in, inexorably led to a, a, a change in orientation among the law schools. It was no sign of submission and witness the reaction to the Federation of Law Societies as an example of that, but it was an acknowledgement, um, sometimes explicit, sometimes tacit, that our future is inextricably intertwined with the future of the legal profession. Um, the Gilded Age was dead. Now, it's true, as some, and there are some in this room, who are nostalgic for the Gilded Age hold out, that our students go on to a multiplicity of careers. So we know that. And we know, as well, that even those who enter conventional legal practice will, will leave in significant numbers after a few years. But only a willfully blind person can refuse to acknowledge that the vast, vast, vast majority of people choose to come to law school because they want to spend at least a portion of their working lives as practicing lawyers. We would have to be willfully blind not to, not to acknowledge that. That surely has to be a, 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 a premise upon which our prognostications about what the future of law school should look like has to be based. It surely has to be it has to be based on that. A second premise that, at least to me, is obvious is that the law is a service profession. Um, we exist, lawyers exist as a professional class to serve the needs of the public. Uh, we became, we lawyers, became important because we facilitated 
um, social change. Remember, the common law began without lawyers. The common law existed for a century and a half, century and a half or thereabouts, before a, 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 a trade called lawyer uh, was seen to exist in, in the history books. But what we did is, is we facilitated the transition from feudalism and absolutism to democracy. We facilitated the, 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 the flow of capital necessary uh, to transition from an agrarian society to an industrial society and now to a post-industrial society and so on and so on. We facilitated the establishment of the administrative state uh, that uh, now has become one of our core values as, uh, as Canadians. The point is that we lawyers, that is, practicing lawyers, were a necessary adjunct to the various processes of social and economic evolution that have taken place in the millennium, in the thousand years since the Norman Conquest. Now, if you accept this premise, and you may not, um, but if you do, then it's axiomatic that at least in its North American form, legal education has to be a service profession too. We exist perhaps not completely, but in significant measure um, to supply the next generation of legal professionals. And therefore, when we're asking ourselves the question about the future of law school, we can't avoid asking the, the, the question about what is the future of the demand for legal services? The kinds of questions that Richard Susskind and Mitch Kowalski and Jordan Furlong and others, others are, 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 are asking. Um, and, and they can ask it, and have asked it in a much more, much more uh, sophisticated way than I, than I can. But we know that lawyers, practicing lawyers, are living in this dual crucible of commodification on one hand and globalization on the other. And when you add into it the mix, add into the mix the relentless pace and evolution of technology, and then layer onto that, the, the, what seems to be the shaky future of the articling system, then the whole foundation of the way in which we do stuff in law schools uh, seems to me to be quite shaky uh, indeed. Um, Harry, in his talk today, and, uh, and more fully in an article that he published earlier this year in the Saskatchewan Law Review, talked about what he called some of the anti-fundamentalist uh, propositions. I, I, I apologize to Harry yesterday evening, but to me, um, they're actually quite fundamental and, and, and as I describe in my paper, serve as, as what I think to be an organizing manifesto for legal education in this, uh, in this, in this age. Um, I won't re reiterate them now. I mean, you heard Harry offer some of them uh, a few moments ago. Uh, instead, what I want to do is offer uh, six things, very briefly, uh, that I think that we could do to make legal education better uh, and that aren't antithetical to the intellectual mission uh, of a university-based law school and that don't involve making more courses compulsory. Um, they are six things that, in my view, in my, in my humble view, uh, can make legal education better than it is today. The first thing I'd say that we need to do is stop talking about what we teach in law schools. Instead, what we need to do is talk about what people learn. Right? That's part of the problem, is that when we talk about reform of legal education, we tend not to ground that in a discussion of how people learn. Now, I bet you every university represented in this room today has a position called something like a vice provost for, for teaching and learning. Well, at our law school, uh, we had our vice provost come in to, to talk. And, and I've got to tell you, I mean, most of us in the room had been doing in this game for a long time. Um, but it was a revelation, you know, the, to, to hear this person, this professional who's, whose area of expertise is how people learn, um, talk about how it is that law students learn today. Um, and since then, my colleague Alice Woolley has been doing some very good, very exciting research on this, uh, on this herself. And, the, and the, the bottom line, the punchline is that the way we teach is not the way people learn. Uh, we, equate, we equate volume with rigor. Right? Law school is hard because we keep shoveling stuff at our students. Right? It's like a, a, a series of tidal waves, sort of one after another. Um, we don't really sort of, most of us anyway, I mean, of course, in all these talks, we're all speaking in generalizations, but most of us sort of don't focus on depth. I, I, have a, I have a good friend who teaches at the University of Tasmania, and he teaches the whole of the real property course, first-year property course, using six cases, 
That's it, six cases. Now, somehow he's acquired the briefs and the factums and, and uh, the, the judgments at, tri at first instance and on appeal and ultimately in the, in the House of Lords or the High Court of Australia. And, um, and he uses them as a vehicle um, to talk about the substantive law of real property, but he uses it also as a vehicle to sort of talk about how lawyers show, talk about how lawyers frame arguments. Um, what happens if you happen to get sort of a judge at first instance who doesn't get it? Uh, and then sort of what you have to try to do then to refocus things on appeal? It's just a magnificent thing. He acknowledges that he sacrifices breadth, um, but he does so because he thinks that um, depth is more important. Well, that's, that's very, very inspiring for me. So we need to ground what we do in, in, in uh, the way people learn, in learning theory. Second thing I think we need to do, and this is something that, uh, that was talked about last night by Jillian, was to focus on solution-oriented analysis. You remember that line from the paper chase? Professor Kingsfield said, in, you know, in his arrogant sort of way, uh, you come in here with heads full of mush and you will leave thinking like a lawyer, thinking like a lawyer. Well, um, that to me is, is pretty much the only justification for the case method. It's hard to imagine a less efficient way of conveying information than the case method of legal education. But what it does do, and I think it does it quite well, is to teach our students to separate chaff from grain and to think over time critically. But lawyers, good lawyers, think in terms of solutions. Um, as, as a client once said to me, I know what my problems are. I don't need some guy to, to, to explain them to me in more flowery language. I need to know what to do. Um, we don't teach that in law school. I mean, there are individuals who do their individual courses, but what we cannot say that in a systematic way, our students are trained in solution-oriented thinking. We can't say that as a matter of systemic observation about Canadian legal education. The Australians can because they employ the tutorial system. We can't. Solution-oriented thinking. Economic analysis. Uh, ec law and economics is a loaded term because of the association with the so-called Chicago School. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that when a client comes to a lawyer and, a, and is seeking legal advice, almost always the lawyer is inviting the client to engage in some sort of cost-benefit analysis. But we don't teach that in law schools. It's a teachable skill, but we don't teach it. That's something that's absolutely critical, uh, I think, in, 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 in a legal education. Whether you end up as a practicing lawyer, or as a public servant, or as an entrepreneur, or as a publisher, um, the ability to make judgments about sort of uh, which is the wisest course of action, it seems to me to be an essential sort of part of the part of skill. Leadership is another thing. You know, David talked about uh, uh, and Dean Cronman's book, uh, uh, the, the, Lost, the Lost Lawyer, we can think about our own heroic figures, people like uh, F.R. Scott, who John McLaren mentioned, and, and um, uh, Sir John A. MacDonald, sort of his leadership uh, uh, in Charlottetown in 1864 and Quebec in 1866. But even workaday lawyers, everyday lawyers, um, are always, in almost every file, are called upon to display leadership. Should I accept the plea bargain? Uh, should I accept the takeover bid? Should I make the deal? Should I break the contract? Um, generally speaking, clients are not paying lawyers for their legal knowledge. They're paying lawyers for their leadership skills. Paying lawyers for their leadership skills. Um, we don't teach that in a systematic way, but we could. You know, Peter Drucker, uh, once famously observed that the, that, that the difference between management and leadership is that management is doing things right, leadership is doing the right things. Um, I think that, again, regardless of the career path, whether they're lawyers or public servants or business people or academics or entrepreneurs, leadership skills are, are absolutely critical to their future, to the future success of our students. Teamwork and project management, they were, they, were talked about, they were talked about last night. I'll just say this, um, if you talk to the discipline council in any law society in our country, and I bet any state bar in the United States, most lawyers who get into trouble um, don't do so because they're wicked. Uh, they do so because they're trying to juggle a dozen balls in the air and one falls because they don't have the skill to maintain sort of all those files in the air and they think, I'll just cover it up for a month 
and then I'll fix it, and I'm not, I'm not, it's not going to end up in my pocket, um, and, and things come out, and, uh, and then, they're, then they're disbarred. Globally minded lawyers. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, so, it's an overused term and a trite term, but the fact is that um, all of us today, whether we're clients or lawyers, all of us today have interests that transcend our boundaries, our borders. And we are doing a disservice to our students, regardless of what they end up doing after law school, if we don't inculcate them uh, a, glow, a sense of global mindedness. And the final one, and I hope that John's going to give me 30 more seconds for this, uh, is legal history. Uh, um, before the Gilded Age, every Canadian law school had a compulsory course in legal history. Throughout the Gilded Age, every Canadian law school ended up abolishing them. The knock on legal history was that it privileged a white Anglo-Saxon male vision of the world. The problem with the current system is that it neglects the fundamental importance of a deep understanding of our legal system. Ours is a legal system built on the doctrine of precedent and that means that it's, inherent, it's an inherently conservative system of social ordering. The yardstick that we use to measure the propriety of the present day is the past. Um, so it's possible to be able to describe the law in fine detail with, without knowing legal history, but I maintain that it's impossible, it's impossible to say that you really understand the law without a sense of legal history. And our legal history didn't begin on, the, on Dominion Day in 1867. Our legal history began on the 15th of October in 1066. The, the, the Norman Conquest is, is a critical part of Canadian legal history, as is Magna Carta, and the Black Death, and the, 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 the Reformation, and the, uh, and the Glorious Revolution. Those are all things that go together uh, to help make our legal system what it is today. Thank you. Thank you, Ian.